I started working out 1988, 36 years ago, and I became interested in longevity in my early 20s. Now, that's kind of a joke with the whole biohacking before it was cool. That's meant to be tongue in cheek. Basically, just focused on my diet uh, and, and working out. And I actually had a lot of trial and error. I became a vegetarian for three and a half years, lost a lot of my, my college muscle, um, hungry all the time. I was trying to eat, live on beans and rice. I was blending my own almonds up to, to make almond milk because it wasn't in the stores in the 90s. And uh, eventually, I got sick. I got a virus that my doc thought I should have been able to shake, except my diet was probably, probably depressing my immune system. So I, added, I didn't like hearing that. And I listened. I added a little fish, eggs, some whey protein. And suddenly, I felt better. It was like my brain woke up. I, I, I went three days later, I kind of realized I haven't had coffee. I'd forgotten to drink coffee. And I never forget to drink coffee, but I, I hadn't needed it. And I started feeling, you know, over time, a month or so, that I was putting some muscle back on. I was getting stronger and felt better after my, I was recovering better after, my, after the workouts. Fast forward a few years, I become a trainer in 98. I started recommending a low-carb diet to my clients in the early 2000s, like 2002, uh, and doing a lot of just circuit training, fast-paced strength training, playing with um, intermittent fasting in 2010. And by 2015, I was doing a 24-hour fast weekly with 15 to 18-hour intermittent fasts through the other days, fasted workouts, um, and, and really still kind of a low-carb, following a low-carb diet. I was doing all the things that I was trying to get my weight loss clients to do, except um, I wasn't trying to lose weight. I looked good, but I didn't feel good. I was very lean, very active. My fasting insulin was really low, like three. Um, but my sleep was terrible. I would feel overtrained all the time, like my muscles were just burned, just walking around, you know. Um, and it wasn't, I mean, my blood work actually, should have told me this. My TSH was really high, which means it's working extra hard to get my pituitary to put out T4 and T3. Sex hormone binding globulin, SHBG, is um, it's basically a protein that will bind to your uh, sex hormones, free testosterone. If that's high, that's a good indication that your cortisol levels are high, right? So cortisol and epinephrine would have been high stress hormones. Um, and, and anything that's lowering your free T is not your friend whether you're male or female. So in my mind, I thought I was doing everything right. I was, I was using all these hermetic stressors. Um, and it was like my, my mantra, my dogma, whatever you want to call it, I was recommending it to everybody. But I was really creating too much metabolic stress. I was, I was eating like a dieter instead of an athlete. But I was trying to work out like an athlete, and I had the metabolic health of an athlete. Um, and I... I wouldn't call any one of those techniques or tools bad. But when they're misused, they aren't helpful. So we need the right strategy or the right tool for the right goal. I was pulling them all at once. And it was overtaxing my system um, because I was clearly overtraining. And I, I would have given the same advice to anybody I spoke to, but for me, if somehow I was blind. I didn't see it myself. And there's a, there's a condition that's pretty well known in the ath athletic fields, you know, with college athletes trying to make weight, professional athletes, it's called RES. It's relative energy deficiency in uh, sport. Basically, you, you're just not recovering. So you have diminished recovery, poor endurance, maybe your libido's low, people start losing their hair. A lot of the same symptoms you would see in someone with very disrupted thyroid. And we know a disrupted thyroid is pretty you know, common among um, people who have a long like extended low carb and low calorie diets. Um, so again, I just wasn't experienced, I wasn't fueling my body the way it needed and it was finally coming back at me. I mean, at this point, I was 49 years old. Um, again, looked great. No one would have known it, except that I, I just felt terrible. And, uh, and now, if you've, if you've been on social media at any point in the last six months, you've probably heard muscles are an organ of longevity. It's kind of become a catchphrase. Why would people say that? 
first of all, muscle is a glucose sink, right? So you have any extra glucose comes in your body, insulin's gonna be elevated, it's gonna drive it into, hopefully, um, muscle, right, as glycogen to be stored for later. That's healthy. Um, so we know in that way, muscle can preserve your metabolic health. Exercise, though, also releases these little chemicals called myokines. And these myokines go all over our body and they actually improve our metabolic health, our metabolic flexibility, when they come in contact with their tissues, other muscles, organs. There's one in particular you've probably heard of, your biohacker, BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is, it is impactful in the rest of the body, but on the brain, it, it directly um, improves the functioning of our hippocampus, which is important for learning and memory, actually doing research with exercise to help people who have um, early stage dementia and, to, and as a prevention. So I, I think for a long time, exercise has been put to the back of the bus, right? Um, behind diet and sleep. I, I don't say it needs to move to the front, but we need to elevate it to realize there's a lot more to exercise than just burning calories. Um, now, as the CDC will tell us, number one cause of fatal and non-fatal injuries for people over 65 is falling. Now, if you watch sports at all, you see people fall all the time, right? It's practically half the sport of soccer. You have people fall all over the place. They're not being carted off to the hospital. They're popping up, running again, they're going to the sidelines. So why, are these, why is falling so debilitating for these people over 65? Well, I mean, because they're, they're not running on a sports field. They're not climbing on rocks. They're tripping over a chair leg in their kitchen and falling on their own floor. They need, it's, it's, muscle, it's their strength, right? They need stronger muscles, stronger bones. And if we don't, if we're not intentional about building that, we lose it, right? So what I'm going to share is what I recommend for building muscle. This QR code will give you some of the research that I've uh, collected to help support what I'm sharing with you. But again, this is what I found works for me. I don't mean for it to be prescriptive, but uh, I have found plenty of anecdotal as well as research uh, evidence to support it. And this is not a weight loss strategy or a way to reverse insulin resistance. So if you have more than 20 pounds to lose or you're insulin resistant, go take care of that. Use the tools with the right strategy because you're going to be much more likely to actually put on muscle if you're in an insulin sensitive state. But what I'm going to share with you is for growth and you're not going to grow and reduce at the same time. So focus on your metabolic health and then come back and then focus on muscle growth. Um, a lot of exercise, I'm not saying don't lift weights if you're trying to lose weight. I'm not saying that at all. A lot of exercises have have benefits beyond just building muscle, right? We're, we're, we're creating insulin sensitivity. We're, we are moving energy through our muscles. We're releasing myokines. There's a lot of benefit. Build endurance, right? But not all of those strategies will help you build muscle, at least beyond the point of those newbie gains that, that hit you in the first six to nine months. So muscle fibers are activated on an as-needed basis, from smallest to largest or from low threshold motor units to high threshold motor units because you're not going to use the same amount of muscle fiber to pick up a cup of coffee as you would a heavy bag of groceries, would you? If you try to use the same force, you'd, you'd have a face full of coffee. Uh, so the low threshold motor units in general, this is kind of in macro, I know I, some biologist is going to argue the nitty gritty of this, but in general, low threshold motor units activate what we call type one muscle fibers. Type 1 muscle fibers are what activates you to go about your day, go to work, maybe do some low-intensity cardio, zone 2 cardio. They're great at burning fat. They have a lot of mitochondria in them. They're not great for strength. They don't really grow beyond a certain point. In fact, most just generally active people will have hit their maximum growth of type 1 fibers uh, just, just from being active, without even doing resistance training. So they're not, not ideal for strength, but they're not meant for that. They're meant to just give us our energy to get throughout the day. Whereas the high threshold motor units, which means they're activated by higher resistance, they activate primarily type 2 fibers, which have fewer mitochondria in them than the type 1. They're very glycolytic, which means they like burning, they, they perform better on glucose. In fact, that's what they demand. Uh, they're, they're not great at burning fat. And they're most susceptible to muscle damage and inflammation from work, but 
They're great for strength, for speed, for power, for growth. And so if you want to build muscle, this is your target. But most people never hit what's left of their type two muscle fibers beyond those newbie gains because of their technique, because of the way they're approaching their strength training. So how do we, how do we target the type two muscle fibers? Well, there's been a lot of theories over the last 20 or 30 years about how to best cause hypertrophy, right? There's metabolic stress, there's muscle damage, and there's mechanical tension. So metabolic stress, we're all familiar with, we felt the burn or we felt the pump. It's a release of metabolites in the muscle. Lactate's released, you get the hydrogen ions feeling that, making that burn. It used to be blamed on lactic acid, it's actually the hydrogen ions. Um, so when they do studies to determine, you know, they try to isolate. Like we, we, could, we could say, well, all these things are happening and there's growth. Well, to know what's actually causing the growth, they need to isolate the cause, right? So if we remove resistance or work from the muscle, but we still add the metabolites like lactate, they really don't see any growth from that. There's no growth from lactate alone or metabolites alone. So it's questionable whether metabolic stress would actually be causing or stimulating muscle growth. And then if you look at runners, like a one mile runner, right? He's putting out a lot of metabolic stress. They don't have really large muscular legs, but they're hitting a mile, you know, sub four minute mile. That's a lot of metabolic stress. They're not really growing big legs. And we know marathon runners or marathon training really is, can actually cause a reduction of both type one and type two muscle fibers. It was, you, you use them so much, put them under so much stress, they actually, uh, you lose muscle. So not ideal for building muscle, right? So that would question whether metabolic stress could actually be effective at building muscle. But it does cause inflammation, which we know can negatively impact our recovery and our performance at subsequent workouts. Muscle damage, we've all heard this one too. Muscle is broken down and rebuilt. And yet, when they do studies where they intentionally cause damage to a muscle through compressive therapy, or comp excuse me, a compressive uh, effect from something like a bruise, right? Essentially, they try to bruise the muscle. It doesn't rebuild bigger or stronger. And the muscle damage again is actually creates, creates a lot of inflammation in those fibers, which can negatively impact future workouts and your recovery from workouts. So we're left with mechanical tension, but what is mechanical tension? This is, this one doesn't get a lot of press. Does get a lot of people writing about in muscle and fitness. Um, but this is when you've created tension within the fiber. Uh, you, you have to have basically a maximal effort, okay? So maximal recruitment of those type two muscle fibers. But there's a slowing of the contraction speed within the muscle. So for instance, you're getting towards the end of the set, you're approaching failure, and suddenly the pace at which you're able to finish contracting that the muscle during the set in each rep starts to slow down. As much as you are putting, as much effort as you're putting out, right, maximal effort, it's slowing down by itself, okay, from the fatigue. And in the slowing of what's happening in the fiber, if I can get a little nerdy with you for a second, um, inside the fiber we have contractile proteins or actin and myosin that move past each other, right? And so maximal force are moving pretty quickly, but as that um, pace of that rep set starts to slow down, they start moving past each other a little bit slower, they're creating a little more friction and they start creating these cross bridges. So the forming of those cross bridges is what actually stimulates the body to, to, create, to bring more proteins into that muscle and create what we call mo muscle protein synthesis or the creation of protein within that muscle. So it's those muscle fibers rubbing past each other in, that slow, in those slower reps right at the end of the set that actually stimulates that growth. So this was explained well I, by uh, a guy named Chris, a researcher named Chris Beersley. That's his website, his Patreon. If you wanted to dig deeper on the stimulating reps theory, that would be a good resource to go to a deep dive if you wanted to. But again, it's the maximal recruitment of muscle fibers is needed with fatigue from those muscle fibers to stimulate more proteins going into the muscle. And that, this, you, can, you can stimulate this with heavy weight or light weight. But I'm explaining why I think heavy weight's a little bit easier or more consistent to uh, hit the goal. So with 
when you're using a heavier weight, so something that would cause you to fatigue in less than 10 reps, let's say, when you start lifting that weight, you are activating the majority of those muscle fibers, or, and, or shortly, within a few reps, activating all the muscle fibers within that muscle. You're hitting those upper threshold type two muscle fibers. And so they're all firing immediately, and you're gonna hit failure sooner, right? Which means you're not gonna build up as much fatigue as you reach that, that slower contraction speed. So you're more likely to get th closer to failure uh, without a lot of discomfort, without a lot of metabolic stress causing that burn. Whereas with lighter weight, you've got to move through fatiguing the type one fibers and then some of the next level of type two fibers before you get to failure. And you start feeling some muscle burn build up, some of that lactate. And the tendency could be your, your maximum perception of effort is what we call it. You start feeling that burn and you say, well, I'm getting, I'm feeling burn. I'm, 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 I'm getting close to failure, but you're, you're really not reaching as far as close to failure as you would if you weren't feeling that burn. So you might stop a little short of that. So you really have to push through a lot of metabolic stress to reach failure, much more so than if you were using a heavier weight in which you're activating those muscle fibers right out of the gate. So it's not that you can't use lighter weight, it's just that you, really, you have to push through a little more discomfort to get to it. Uh, and and when do we see, how do we know we're reaching this mechanical tension? So you, as I mentioned before, so the last four to six reps, give or take, okay, so that's not, a, that's not a set number. But as you start to notice those reps slow down with your maximum effort, it's going to be those last four to six reps that you're getting all of that mechanical tension really being built up and creating that friction between those proteins. So using, you've probably heard of slow training where people intentionally slow their pace of their set down or the reps down. Not that that's bad, but, but slowing it down intentionally is not creating the same level of friction because you're not getting the maximum recruitment because you're not putting out maximum effort. If you're intentionally slowing the, the set down, you're not recruiting all the muscle fibers. You could be pushing harder, right? So eventually you'll get there. It's like doing a longer set. You just have to push through. You have to wait until everything starts fatiguing and then you'll get there. But slowing it down intentionally is not creating the same level of friction as if you have maximum effort and it's slowing down involuntarily. So how do we make this happen? How do we structure our workout? Because we want to stimulate enough growth to, to create muscle protein synthesis, but we don't want to have so much that we create so much fatigue and, that we can't recover from before our next workout or even create fatigue that limits the, the, the performance at the next workout. Because your performance in your workout is what determines how many of those muscle fibers, those type two muscle fibers, you actually recruit. Uh, so we want to get the, the, the effective reps, but limit fatigue. So I've, got, I've included in the studies a meta-analysis that looked at a, a large number of studies that looked at sets and reps and combinations of volume to create hypertrophy. And what they found was the, the, the greatest limiting factor for hypertrophy was actually volume. And it was too much volume. It wasn't not enough. It was, it was too much. Too much volume actually limits hypertrophy. Versus, as a, compared to what we hear on social media, volume is king. That doesn't play out in the studies. And what they found was the, the sweet spot for these studies seemed to be four to six sets per muscle group and then to train more frequently. In other words, hit that same group of muscles another time in the week rather than doing like a bro set where you're, you're, you know, you're hitting two or three muscles on Monday and another two or three muscles on two, and then it's like once a week. You know, combine a few different muscle groups together, hit just four to six sets, and then come back to them later in the week. Uh, and I found a few more studies that have included there, both male and female, trained male and female athletes, five to 10 sets for muscle group trained, seem to uh, provide more hypertrophy than 15 or 20. So over and over again, the, the literature is showing fewer sets done correctly, done to failure. All sets in studies are done to failure. So fewer sets done to failure actually has a lot more impact on hypertrophy than doing 15, 20, 30 sets. Contrary to what you're going to hear from bodybuilders and a lot of influencers on, on Instagram. We have a concept called reps in reserve. And this means when you intentionally stop your set, one or two reps right before failure. Now, why would you do this? Well, because failure 
creates a lot of inflammation. It, it, when we go all the way to failure, there's a lot of inflammation and fatigue created that takes longer to recover from. So we have studies showing, comparing people who stopped at one or two, what we call RIR, reps in reserve. That would be, if you know you're going to fail at 10 reps, right? If you go all the way to failure, it's at 10. You choose to stop two IRR. That would be stopping at eight, right? So two reps, two reps in reserve before failure. That created as much hypertrophy. So you got as many effective reps as you needed to, to stimulate growth but you didn't have the same level of fatigue and inflammation. So you actually recovered better by stopping just short of failure, but you still got enough stimulus for the growth. So we want to, again, limit fatigue and those high threshold monitoring, as, as I mentioned before, they're easily fatigued. They're very likely, they burn glucose and they're very easily fatigued. So if we fatigue them too much, they don't recover, they don't grow, and many times they're not even available during the rest of the workout because they're just, they're shot. And the exercises done early in the workout will actually be the ones that get the most uh, benefit. So how do we want to structure things? Well, we can look at maybe uh, the, what the bodybuilders did prior to the 1950s. So after the 1950s, we saw a lot more steroid use come into the bodybuilding world. So what did, what did bodybuilders do prior to steroid use becoming so prevalent. Well, not that we want to be, all become bodybuilders, but success leaves clues. So if you look at these, these guys did from the silver area, era of um, bodybuilding, they had very limited sets and reps that they used. One, one to six working sets per muscle group in a workout. Um, maybe one to three exercises per uh, muscle group and one to three working sets. So they might really do a whole body workout, full body workout, one or two sets for a muscle group, and then move on to the next one. They might do full body workouts three times a week, like on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, make sure they had rest in between. That would seem, that would seem odd to many of the, you know, uh, the bros in the gym you come across, right? What an odd, well, that's, well, you're not gonna grow that way. You need volume. You need to be working out five or six days a week. That's not what we saw from the guys who were, who were the, the key, these, some, some of these guys are movie stars because of their build. The guy on the right there was Hercules in the movie Hercules in the 1960s who inspired Sylvester Stallone. No steroids. They accomplished this with minimal sets, heavy reps. They used heavy, excuse me, heavy weight for lower reps, like five to nine reps. So Rest between sets is also a, a question people, should I be resting 60 seconds, minute and a half, three minutes? Resting two or three minutes between each set seems to be the most consistently found effective way um, in these studies. Again, they're training each set to failure, uh, but you'll get more reps in in the following sets. In other words, you rest two to three minutes, you're more likely to hit the same amount of reps with the weight you just used in the first set. And that allows for more of those stimulating reps to be hit because you ha you've allowed fatigue to subside. And of course, the question I've heard since I started lifting, machines or free weights, which is better? And you'll, you, again, you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, free weights, free weights, free weights. What's the goal? Is it athletics or to grow muscle? Not that you can't have both, not you can't, you shouldn't phase maybe 12, eight to 12 weeks in your year, a couple times a year just to focus on growth and then switch to something else, endurance or mobility or or you know, athletic performance, change up your workout. It's not that you have to focus on growth year long, but let's, let's understand that, uh, what are the best tools to accomplish your goals? So free weights require a lot more stability to perform. You know, we have to balance a bar on our back or we have to balance a bar over our chest and we have to worry about that, that the danger of something being, you know, being stuck on it, right? Um, they require a lot more energy. That means you have a lot more energy going to those stabilizer muscles or going to stabilize your spine. Uh, and then, so that means you have less force production going to those primary movers, the ones you're trying to grow. And so that's, you're, you're essentially dissipating energy away from the, ones, the muscles you're, you're focusing on in order to stabilize the equipment you're using. Again, great for athletics, for creating stability, but when it comes to pure growth and stimulating those type two muscle fibers that maybe you haven't reached yet, machines seem to be winning. Bar again, barbell squat versus a machine squat. Uh, bend over barbell row versus a row where you have a chest support and you're just pulling against the machine. 
or a bench press versus a machine press. You're going to mentally feel a lot more comfortable and safer pushing yourself with heavy weight close to failure if you're in a, a machine or a piece of equipment that allows you to push hard and not worry about failing and getting hurt. You're just mentally, you're going to be, feel more free to, to, to give more during that set. So again, if, whatever muscles you want to focus on, do that early on, just because they're going to get the best of your energy. Uh, if you're focused on glutes, glutes excuse me, uh, hip thrusts, kickbacks. A lot of guys, you know, it's, it's, it's the chest. They want the big barrel chest. Obviously, start with your, your chest presses. Uh, women who want, want a little more of the cap shoulders and the, and the, and the V back, that's, that should be your early workout, your early, excuse me, your early sets in the workout. Focus on the things where you want the most progress early on because, again, as that fatigue builds up during your workout, that's going to impact your ability to reach those high threshold motor units and those high threshold fibers during the rest of your workout. And they may, they may just be tapped out by the time you get there. So here's an example of a leg workout, just to give you some context. Again, not prescriptive. It's an example. Uh, but again, starting with hip thrusts, just you know, do your warm-up sets. Get everything warm, get everything moving. And then for your working set, one or two sets of six to nine reps, five to nine reps, stopping just one or two reps short of failure, you're going to hit those muscle fibers that you haven't been able to hit before without creating a lot of excess fatigue. Move on to your squats, again, a couple sets, and then maybe do some of the more stable exercises like leg curls or leg extensions that are isolating, um, where you can really put more energy into it. Maybe you can do single leg, but it allows you to put more energy into those sets. But there, the later you get in the workout, the less energy you're going to have to try to access those muscle fibers. So make it as easy as possible for you to exert as much force on, that, on your focused muscle. Here's a good upper body workout. And again, it's just an example. But if you're doing full upper body, four sets pushing, four sets pulling, and don't, don't feel like you have to get everything. Focus on those, the, you know, a couple exercises for each muscle group and do them well, do them heavy, hit those high threshold motor units, and then move on. And your next workout might be a different group of exercises to hit those same muscle groups. Sleep. <clears throat> Long been kicked to the curb as well prior to the, the 1990s, maybe the 2000s, right? Sleep when you're dead. If we don't get enough sleep, we won't recover. Uh, here's a few points. You guys are all biohackers. You've heard the benefits of sleep. You, you know what you do during the day impacts the quality of your sleep at night. So finish dinner three hours or more before bed. Don't consume alcohol three hours before bed. Uh, start your, this is what, start your, early, your circadian clock early in the morning with sun exposure and uh, breakfast. I, I recommend 30 grams of protein as a minimum to kind of get your, uh, get that protein in, create some satiety, stimulate the muscle protein synthesis in, at each meal, ideally. Um, but it does, this was a big one for me to improve my sleep uh, because I was a big intermittent faster. So cortisol levels are high. Started adding breakfast and it improved my sleep, I believe, through the lowering of that cortisol, right? So less stress, less metabolic stress allowed my cortisol and epinephrine to come down. And, uh, and that's it's advice. If you guys know who Molly Eastman is, she's speaking tomorrow. This is, this is the advice she gave me. And uh, so I definitely, attend, if sleep is an issue for you, I would definitely attend her uh, presentation. She's the sleep sensei. So this is just a few points just kind of help you move in the right direction. Keep your room as dark as possible in a temperature of 62, 67 degrees. These are basics. Most of you have heard all of these. But also I bet a lot of you do some intermittent fasting because that's kind of a, that's kind of a biohack, right? I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying you can't have it in your life. But if, you're trouble, if you have trouble with sleep or you're not growing muscle, uh, it might be some, something you want to adjust or maybe not do as often back off on it a little bit and see how that helps you. So eating, another controversial topic, eating for muscle mass, track, I believe in tracking calories and macros, even if you don't do it all the time, like indefinitely, do it at least long enough to get an idea of how much food you should be eating, what that looks like in your diet, what your plate should look like so you can prep, you know, you're making sure you're hitting your macros, you're making sure you're getting enough calories, 
or the calories to, to fit your goals because what isn't measured isn't managed. So it's easy these days to know how much we burn and consume for the most part, right? If you're wearing a can of watch that tracks your calories, you can get an easy read or an oil ring, a whoop strap, you can get an easy read on your resting and your active calories. So you can know what you burn in a day. And then you just track your food on my fitness pal and say, hey, am I hitting my macro goal? Am I getting enough calories? Or am I way over my way over, right? Uh, I personally use a food scale. I'm kind of, you know, a little nitpicky about it because I want to get eyes on it. When I was having that kind of problem, eating intuitively, it wasn't really intuitively. I was over cranking all my hormetic stressors, right? I was thinking I was doing the right thing. And when I really started measuring things, I realized I was way off. So I use a food scale. I'm one of those guys. Uh, and Internet Fitness Pal to make sure I'm on track. And that's peace of mind for me. It's a little extra trouble to, for me to know I'm, I'm on track for my calories. Uh, and it doesn't take a lot. If you, you hear people talk about the bulk to eat to gain muscle, you really don't need to consume 500 or 1,000 extra calories to build muscle. You just 10% over maintenance. So if your total caloric burn for a day is 2,500 calories, 10% is 250, it's easy math. 2,750 is maintenance, or 10% 10, 10 over maintenance, excuse me. That's enough to allow your body to recover and gain muscle. You don't need to, you don't need to be consuming tons of you know, pancakes and all these crazy cheat meals that you see uh, these bodybuilders posting about, right? Uh, eating at maintenance will allow for some recomposition, meaning that you'll probably won't, your weight probably won't change. You'll probably get a little leaner. It's kind of a, almost an even exchange of muscle to, to fat, give or take. Okay, these are, I'm not a calories in, calories out guy, especially with weight loss, but if the more metabolically healthy you are, the more you can impact your weight by just keeping an eye on your calories. It, it's much more of an effective method when you're metabolically healthy. If you're metabolically sick, insulin resistant, you've got a lot of other things going on and it does not have the same impact. So I, I, I wanna make sure that's understood. Um, but, and again, if weight loss is your main concern, use resistance training to hold on to muscle while you're losing weight. So I don't use exercise as a way to burn off calories. I, I use calories as a metric of how I fuel for my performance and recovery. So that's a different perspective on most people. I got to go to the gym to burn off calories. Hmm. Why don't we use calories to fuel how we want to train our bodies? And think of it like an athlete. Uh, ideal protein intake, is, in my opinion, 0.8 to one gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight. So if your goal weight is 160 and you're looking at 0.8 to one gram of protein per day, that's 130 to 160 grams of protein a day. Uh, the older we get, everything gets more difficult, right? But we, it's harder to assimilate protein. In other words, we, we can eat the same amount we did 30 years ago, but we're not gonna absorb all of that, and it's not gonna be as easy for our bodies to, to recycle it, to put it to use, to put it in our bodies. So ideally, spread that protein intake out over three or four meals in the day to keep stimulating that muscle protein synthesis. Ideally, um, at least 30 grams or more in a meal because that's the amount we need of a certain amino acids like leucine to stimulate that muscle protein synthesis. So, and that's animal protein. If you're doing plant protein, you're gonna bump that up a good 40% because it doesn't have as many of those uh, branched chain amino acids to stimulate the muscle protein synthesis. So you're gonna need a little more protein if you're doing plant. But I'm a, I'm a big advocate of animal protein. So, hi, Susan, yeah. Yeah, so do I take branched chain, branch chain amino acids, essential amino acids? Or anything like that? I get most of my protein from whole food, from meat. If I'm doing an early workout before I've had a chance to have breakfast, yeah. then I will put a little branch chain or some kind of amino in, into something with some creatine and then drink that to get the, the aminos in my system available for the muscle because, again, I'm trying to avoid extra stress and I want to give them something to work with. But yes, that's enough. The you know, essential amino acids of the branch chain, usually in a dose high enough to get the leucine and isoleucine and sort of the, the, those stimulating factors for muscle protein synthesis, I would definitely take that at minimum or, or even just a scoop of some sort of 
whey or beef-based protein powder, just something that would get that in there in your system prior to working out if you're one of those early morning weightlifters. Um, I still think that whole food protein from a good source of meat is your best bet because you have the food matrix there and you have all the other nutrients that come with it that we just can't replace in a, in a processed powder. But I'm not saying those are bad or, or don't have a use. I think they have an application. I just don't use them on a regular basis. It's not part of my plan. It's, it's, that answers your question? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I found that carb intake is beneficial and even necessary for growing muscle, especially as I got older. Uh, and I'm, I tell you, I'm a low-carb guy. I started, again, recommending low-carb 2002 for weight loss. But I think it's, it, it needs to be designated for the appropriate goal. It's a tool. Uh, and studies are showing improved strength, anaerobic performance, hypertrophy, and even recovery is improved through a higher-carb versus lower-carb diet. Higher-carb and lower-carb, those are, those are sort of objective terms people throw around. In studies, they, anything 25% or less of calories coming from carbs is considered low carb. If it's above 25%, it's considered high carb in those studies. So that's, that's what I mean by high carb versus low carb, not 70% from carbs, right? It could be 30, 35, 40%. If you, any of you old enough, I'm sure so I am, uh, remember the zone diet for 40, 30, 30 was 40% carbs, 30 protein, 30 fat. And that was his, his, his recommendation for athletic, you know, metabolically healthy people to not overgain weight, but fuel their athletic activity. Uh, so uh, you don't want to, you're not going to maximize growth with a weight loss diet. It kind of just makes sense, right? Intuitively, um, it's kind of like trying to go up the down escalator. It, you're, you're working against yourself. And again, we're looking at the high, just to repeat this, high threshold type 2 muscle fibers. They're very glycolytic. They love glucose. That's what they burn best. Because when you're doing anaerobic activity, so any activity in which you would fatigue in three minutes or less, 65% of your energy or more, up to 80, 90% is coming from glucose, whether it's blood glucose, muscle glycogen, whether you like it or not, your body cannot burn fat fast enough to fulfill the needs of anaerobic performance. Um, and that's why the liver, which is full of glycogen, will break down that glycogen and dump glucose into your bloodstream while you're working out or any stressful situation, an argument. You're mad in traffic. You know, you're, you're giving a, a speech in front of a room full of people. You know, your body is dumping glucose to deal with that stress. Uh, the, the benefit of exercising is you get to actually use it up. Uh, but the contribution of glycerol from breaking down fat, okay, so we can, glycerol is like almost like similar to a glucose molecule. We break down fat, glycerol is holding those fats together in a triglyceride. We break that down, the, the contribution from glycerol is minimal. And again, fat oxidation is just too slow to keep up with anaerobic performance. And you'll hear people say, I mean, I've, I've friends and colleagues in the carnivore and keto world, and um, that's why I came out of the low-carb world. They'll tell you, there are no essential carbs. Okay, there's no essential carbs for life. You can survive without them, but I would argue if you can thrive without them. Um, I, in a metabolically healthy person, they're not only beneficial, I think they're optimal when you're active, and especially if you're trying to grow muscle. So gluconeogenesis. What about gluconeogenesis? Okay. Uh, Gluconeogenesis is a process which your liver breaks down amino acids and turns it into glucose or glycogen, right? To replace your stores when, when there's not enough glucose present. Part of that process, as I mentioned before, you're raising cortisol, epinephrine, glucagon. These are stress hormones. And you're taking that stored protein, that stored amino acids from your muscle, your bones, and your skin. Now, I don't care what age you are, but if you're aging and you want to hang on to muscle and have strong bones, you don't need to be leeching it. It kind of seems silly to me to be breaking down muscle to create glucose for a workout to build muscle. Yeah. That's, that's like, again, going, trying to go up the down escalator. Uh, and it's a much slower replenishment of glycogen than just eating a sweet potato after your workout. So, and I, I'm whole food, whole food carbs. I'm not saying... Go get a big gulp in the french fries. I'm not saying that. Uh, but we, we need to reframe 
our concept of carbs and in, 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 as, a, as food that we've always eaten. And prior to, like say, 1901, the obesity rate was 1%. We had almost no type 2 diabetes. It wasn't even labeled yet. We had type 1, but we didn't know what type 2 diabetes was. Heart disease was almost non-existent. There are very few studies on it. And we, everybody was eating potatoes and rice and wheat, right? We didn't have obesity. That came on with processed food. And you can track the influx of processed food into our food system right along with obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. So fueling before and after workouts. Again, I was a big fasted workout guy. I did every time. Thought it was amazing until it wasn't, right? Until it, until it came all crashing down. Combination of protein and carbs, one or two hours before a workout to improve your performance. Again, the better your performance in the workout, the more likely you are to reach those muscle fibers that you haven't been reaching in prior workouts to, to, to create growth, right? You're just going to perform better because you're going to work out harder and, hit and activate those muscle fibers. And then a combination of protein and carbs within an hour after the workout to improve your recovery so that you're ready for the next workout. So this is what I do. Again, not prescriptive. Oh, yes. Susan. Uh, Cindy, what are the whole food carbs besides sweet potatoes that you eat? Oh, uh, it's coming up in a slide. Awesome. All right. <laughs> Go a second. No. Uh, I'm, it's, I don't want to miss it. No, no, no. You want fruit, white potatoes for me. Okay, this is like fruit, white potatoes, uh, sweet potatoes, occasionally white rice. Some people grate on white rice. Some people want to avoid arsenic and uh, heavy metals or just the mold and you need to rinse it a lot. So, but anything that's just a single ingredient carb that you would ideally get from somewhere in the produce section or somewhere, you know what I mean, like on the perimeter of your, of your grocery store. But one ingredient, not five, right? Um, so here's my macros. I'm, I'm, I weigh about 210-ish, give or take. So 200 grams of protein, general target, that's about 800 calories. Uh, and that usually comes with, because I'm eating... Whole cuts. I'm not eating chicken breasts and tuna out of the can, guys. I can't stand it. I am not a, I'm not a fat phobe either. Um, I like good, tasty meat with fat in it. I really do. I love beef. And uh, so my 200 grams of protein usually comes with 100 grams of fat. That's not me lumping avocado and butter on top of everything. That's just what comes with the meat, generally. Uh, and so that's about 1,700 calories from protein and fat. And then, so I'm... 1,200 calories short of my, if I showed you before, I, I burn about 2,900 2, calories a day. That leaves me 20, 1,200 calories short. Well, that's way, 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 way under what I need just from eating meat and fat. So 300 calorie, or 300 gar carbs, grams of carbs, gives me about 1,200 calories in that um, meat set deficit. So that puts me at maintenance at 300 carbs. I was never eating 300 carbs before, prior to this you know, my, my little revelation where I was underfeeding myself and, and working out too hard. Uh, and again, potatoes, sweet potatoes, fruit, and white rice. Those that make up the majority of my carbs. I cook at home. <laughs> I don't eat out much. Uh, but that's what makes me feel better. I feel better after I eat when I eat these things. And I'm, my, my fasting is still great. I'm, I'm not putting on any extra weight. I like where I am. Uh, macro ratio is approximately, like I mentioned, like the, like the zone, 35 to 40% carb, give or take. This can vary a bit, 25 to 30% from protein and 30 to 35% from fat. Your typical bodybuilder would be, would look at that and go, too much fat, not enough carb. So this is not a high carb diet. They're doing, you know, or even an athlete is doing, who's training four hours a day. They're looking at 60, 70% coming from carbs. Lower fat, probably, because it's not as slow energy. It'd probably be at 20% fat, maybe 25, 30% protein. Um, and if I want to lean out a little bit, like I'm trying to do for like some of the pictures you saw, yeah, that, that's if I'm trying to get in front of a camera, I might back off a little bit. You know, back off 100 grams of carbs, that puts me at about a 15% below maintenance on calories. And because I'm insulin sensitive, my body responds to that. And I can slowly lean out at a manageable pace and still retain muscle. It's not a crash diet. It's just a little shift in the carb intake and the energy coming in, the quick energy. And it's enough to let my body say, okay, we need to shift to more, a little more burning fat, a little more fat burning. 
And that allows me to lean out, again, slowly and hanging on to muscle. And not to be prescriptive. Find the ratio that works best for you. Find the ratio that gives you the energy you need, fits your goals for performance and whatever, you know, weight gain, weight loss goals you have personally. I think even if you're not interested in, in building muscle, right? And, and this seems like theoretical, odd, you know, things you just don't want to deal with. If, if I can just convey one thing, is that we need to pay attention to what our bodies are telling us because none of us are getting any younger. But I think if you're in this room, you have an interest in your health. You, you, you want to make an impact in some way, whether it's your career, your family, um, some sort of passion, some kind of cause you believe in. And you want to have the energy to keep doing that well past, if you look around, your colleagues, as they get past 40, 50, 60, some aren't looking so good, are they? They're not performing so well. They're maybe a, a, some sort of metabolic disease is taking them out of the game. Or they're on eight different meds to manage what, what used to, you know, their blood pressure, their, their blood sugar. Um, and you don't want to be there. That's why you're here. So why risk all of the wisdom and experience, the circle of influence you've created over the last several decades because you weren't paying attention to your health, right? So we're all paying attention to our health in here. But that is, that is my motivator for, for, that is my impact that I want to make, to convey. It's like you hit 50 or 60, you don't need to let off the gas, you just need a better strategy, right? So we need to pay attention to our blood work, to all these tracking apps we're all wearing, right? Who doesn't have an aura ring or a whoop strap or doing something to, to track their, their sleep, right? Um, we need to remain intellectually curious because that was my downfall. I didn't see my blind spots until it, until it became too big to ignore. Uh, and if we really want to optimize for health and perf for performance and longevity, we don't need dogma. We need a better strategy. So, and that, that QR code again will get you the research that I collected to support this.